listener is shocked by deliberate dissonance, by a confused stream of sound. Snatches of melody, the beginnings of a musical phrase, are drowned, emerge again, and disappear in a grinding and squealing roar. The composer has ignored the demand of Soviet culture that all coarseness and savagery be abolished from every corner of Soviet life. Here is music turned deliberately inside out in order that nothing will have anything in common with simple musical language accessible to all. The power of good music to infect the masses has been sacrificed to a petty bourgeois formalist attempt to create originality through cheap clowning. It is a game of clever ingenuity that may end very badly. From the editorial Muddle Instead of Music, Pravda, January 28, 1936. Shostakovich's Fourth Symphony occupies a special place in the composer's catalog. More than any of his other works in the genre, this piece gives us a sense of the path he might have pursued as a symphonist if he'd lived in less threatening political circumstances. He began composing it in earnest in late September of 1935, when he was still being hailed as a young lion of Soviet music. He'd been formulating ideas for the piece since the previous year. This was typical of Shostakovich, whose legendary creative efficiency was derived from a natural tendency to imagine a piece substantially in his head before picking up his pen. In many respects, writing it down was akin to taking dictation. Reveling in his position as a symbol of enlightened modernism, Shostakovich described the fourth, whose grandiose scale reflects his passion for the music of Mahler, as his artistic credo. The symphony was most likely in its final stages of composition in January of 1936 when Stalin walked out of a performance of Shostakovich's previously widely hailed opera Lady Macbeth of Mitsensk District, setting the stage for the editorial in Pravda that cast the composer into official disgrace. And yet when the work was finished in May, it lacked any sign that this denunciation, which carried enormous professional and personal implications, had affected his artistic choices. Although highly anxious by nature, Shostakovich possessed a remarkable ability to focus completely on the task at hand when it came to his music. But trouble lay ahead. <laughs> The premiere of the Fourth Symphony by the Leningrad Philharmonic was scheduled for December 11, 1936. Predictably, the rehearsals were marked by an atmosphere of extreme tension. Any association with what party officials decried as formalist art exposed artists and administrators to significant peril, and the fact that a performance of the Fourth Symphony was considered at all reflected the high esteem in which Shostakovich was held by musicians. He was eventually summoned to a meeting, where he was told by a small committee that the symphony's premiere was being cancelled, and that in order to save the orchestra and its administration embarrassment, a statement would be issued to indicate that Shostakovich had withdrawn the piece voluntarily. On the morning of the premiere, the following thoroughly Orwellian notice was posted. Composer Shostakovich appealed to the Leningrad Philharmonic with a request to withdraw his fourth symphony from performance on the grounds that it in no way corresponds to his current creative convictions and represents for him a long outdated phase. For the next 25 years, the Fourth Symphony was essentially disappeared in much the same way the government would eliminate the very existence of a deposed high official from public view. The piece was almost consigned to oblivion. Its score was lost during the Siege of Leningrad, and it was only by a stroke of luck that it was eventually reconstructed when the original orchestral parts were found. Although the symphony was known by a few of Shostakovich's colleagues through an arrangement for two pianos, it remained a forbidden work well into the Khrushchev era. In 1961, the recently appointed conductor of the Moscow Philharmonic, Kirill Kondrashin, asked Shostakovich about the possibility of giving the Fourth Symphony its first performance. Eight years after Stalin's death, artists were enjoying greater creative latitude, and within this less threatening political environment, the composer approved Kondrashin's proposal. 
The premiere took place in Moscow on December 30th, 1961. In spite of its unusual structure, in which two movements that recall the massive scale and stream of consciousness articulation of musical ideas that characterize Mahler's symphonies stand as bookends for a concise, waltz-like middle movement that's filled with echoes of the Austrian master's sardonic scherzi, the sheer assertiveness and confidence of the writing transfix the audience. The work's complexity seemed hardly relevant, within a broader context defined by a mode of expression so ruthlessly immediate it evokes the aura of an unstoppable natural force. The overall effect was described by Shostakovich's friend Flora Litvinova the following day in a diary entry. Yesterday we were invited by Dmitry Dmitrievich to hear the Fourth Symphony. It made a shattering impression, with its qualities of impetuosity, dynamic drive, contrasts of rhythm and color, tenderness and spikiness. One thinks about what a different path he would have taken, how different his life would have been if it were not for the historic decree. Now the symphony enjoyed an enormous success. Dmitry Dmitrievich said he had not changed one note in it. Its exceptional maturity and finished perfection shone through from the first to the last. Lady Macbeth and the Fourth Symphony were surely high points of Shostakovich's creative career. <laughs>